Solutions. And I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning on our introduction to Microsoft Dynamics NAV for government contractors. Um, today we're going to be providing an overview of Microsoft Dynamics NAV, a fully integrated mo business management solution for government contractors. So today's presentation will include um, some examples of the executive dashboard, our fully integrated time, web time and expense system, as well as uh, project setup, including billing and managing funding. We'll also cover invoicing and invoice formats, and we're going to try to get into managing indirect rates as well. So just a few housekeeping things to go over real quick. The webinar is being recorded, and it's going to be posted to our PVBS YouTube account later today. And as we go through this, if you have some questions, please post those into the pane for us so that we can get to those. Um, we'll try to get them as we go. We'll also try to save a little room at the end to, to answer some questions or follow up if we can. If we cannot get to your question, we'll, we'll contact you separately. Okay? Also, later today, you should receive an email invitation to take a post-webinar survey. We really appreciate any feedback that you can provide us. Uh, we do want to make this a better learning tool for, for everyone. So please take a minute, answer a few questions for us. Um, we do greatly appreciate that. So the agenda for today's webinar uh, will include a brief introduction about Pleasant Valley Business Solutions, or PVBS. And then we're going to jump right into a demonstration of the product. And if we're again, if we're able to, we'll, we'll answer questions as we go along. We know there are some spots that, you, that a lot of folks have questions about or want to see a little, little bit more detail. We'll be happy to do that. Just post those into the questions area for us. Um, so a little bit about Pleasant Valley Business Solutions, PVBS. We are a top-tier Microsoft Business Solutions partner serving only the government contracting market. Our headquarters are just outside Washington, D.C. in Reston, Virginia which gives us a unique access and insight into the GovCon community. And as an experienced leader with over 12 years of success in the government contracting market, intelligent innovator with Microsoft Systems, PVBS is a direct resource uh, to both government contractors and Microsoft communities. Okay? Um, Microsoft Dynamics NAB for government contractors from PVBS is a rich, robust accounting solution compliant with federal rules and regulations provides complete integration and ease of use, which we're going to cover today. So PVBS, and we're also driven to develop excellence in providing the most comprehensive solutions to our customers and our partnership channels. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Mr. Paul Skrupski. He's one of the founders of VP of Sales and Marketing here at Pleasant Valley. So Paul, I'll turn it over to you, sir. All right. Well, thank you, Damon. I appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to presenting for the folks on the phone today. So uh, my background is in ERP systems and also process improvement. So I've been working with uh, Microsoft Dynamics NAV since the late 90s and uh, looking forward to uh, getting into the product for you today. So for those that are not familiar, uh, Microsoft Dynamics NAV um, is one of Microsoft's four business solutions products, but it is the leader by far. Uh, for mid-market, small mid-market companies. So today, actually, I was at uh, Microsoft Convergence with Damon just a month ago, and we heard the news that there's now over 110,000 companies using Microsoft Dynamics NAV. So it's actually the most widely used product in the world in terms of accounting business software for mid-market companies. So really exciting news there. And just the overall user base continues to grow. And I think the thing that we see is with that continued growth has become even stronger investments for Microsoft. And we're going to show some of those investments today uh, as it relates to Microsoft Dynamics NAV 2015. And this slide kind of gives you a little idea in terms of the different vertical markets where NAV is focused. And Microsoft's model is that they deliver solutions that meet the needs of a lot of different industries. So NAV is in use by a lot of different organizations throughout the world of varying sizes. And what they look to is partners to kind of take it that last mile. So whether it's deliver industry capabilities or provide industry consulting expertise, that's what makes it a solution. So that's what we've done is, like Damon mentioned, our business is focused. 100% on companies that sell to the federal government. So those are companies that are providing professional services, manufacturing products, and also reselling products. So today's presentation is going to be more focused on the project side of things, but 
I'll show you some uh, the high level view of all the different areas that Dynamics NAV can support for your business. And our solutions are not only uh, incorporated into NAV, but they're actually also certified from Microsoft Dynamics. So it's called CFMD. So the solutions that we develop inside of NAV, they're certified and tested by Microsoft. So that kind of just gives you a little high level overview. And really today's goal is to spend some time inside the system and give people a flavor for how it's helping our clients to better run their business. And the way that we see it is we call it Compliance Plus. So this is a solution that's going to meet all of your compliance needs, plus it's going to help you to better run your organization. So where I want to start out, because it's the from Convergence, it was not just about Dynamics NAV and the Microsoft Dynamics products. It was also about how all the Microsoft suite works together. And one of the things that we heard is there's been amazing adoption of Office 365. So because of that, we wanted to show a little bit how NAV works with Office 365. And what I'm showing here is inside of Office 365, this is just a SharePoint page. And what you're able to do is in SharePoint actually embed different components of NAV um, so someone can get a high level view. So at the top side, I'm showing a financial performance chart giving me information about you know, net income, uh, information about revenue and expenses, over to the right, information about my trial balance currently. Uh, and then as I go below, you're seeing information about receivables and payables. And I can sort these things in different ways. What's different slash unique is that not only am I getting a picture from SharePoint, but the data behind the scenes, NAV is backing that up. So when I drill into something, it actually drops me right into NAV, and I can actually get to the financial reports or get to details about the AR or AP. So in essence, you can provide a dashboard to somebody, but it actually, if with the security rights, they can actually drill in and get to the detail as needed. So that's one area how Office 365 is being leveraged. This component is SharePoint within Office 365. But even if you're using the on-premise version, you can use an on-premise version of SharePoint to do the same type of thing. In addition, NAV has three different types of clients. So that, that was kind of the first one we showed is you access things through SharePoint. The second thing is, you can access it just through a browser. So this web client is going to give you the ability to get into all aspects of NAV. And then based on your role, your home page is going to be designed a certain way. So this is somebody that's really on the sales side. It's showing information about sales orders and uh, order activity um, for companies that are product related. This becomes a key part of how they manage their business. So this is the second client, which is the web client. Now I'm going to pop into the full client, or Microsoft calls it the rich client. And from that rich client, what you're going to see is a similar experience to that web client. In this example, though, I'm logged in as someone in a project-based firm. So there's two pieces we're talking about. We're talking about this idea of a role tailored client. So based on my role, I've got a home page designed a certain way. There's also role-based security, which means that the security rights are attached to a role. So you can have a role like a, an AP person. And that AP clerk role, you can define what they can do in the system, read, write, insert, modify, delete, et cetera. So in my project-based role, I can see information about invoicing, expenses that need to be processed by accounting, any type of timesheet corrections. And these visual cues or activities, I can actually drill into them. So if I drill into that list of expense reports, here's the one that's been approved, but accounting hasn't processed it yet. If I want to look at the additional details, I can just double click that. And now it launches the expense report. And I'm seeing all information about that expense report. So things like the project that the expenses were charged against and also the task. How was the expense paid for? Was it paid for by the company, paid for with the employee's own card or cash, or a personal item that was company paid? I could also look at any attachments. So the attachments would be receipts related to 
that particular expense report. And then from an approval perspective, we can see this one was already approved, but who approved it and when did they? So you can see I've got two approvers that have approved this in this expense report before accounting does their final review and processes it. So that's the idea of that role center is give people the information pertinent to their role and make it easy to get to things. And as a user, I also have that ability to personalize it. So whether it's you know hiding these different components, or in this case, you can show your Outlook pieces, and I could decide you know maybe I want to show uh, my my mailbox in addition to my calendar and tasks. I could add that now. It's showing me how much mail is in my inbox right now. Over to the right, I call this the My section. And the idea here is on my home page, I can have a subset of a master list. In this case, I've got my four jobs that I get into in most every demo. I can actually go to the full list by managing that list or go to the list of jobs over here. But I can just add and remove new projects as needed. So as other projects become more important, I can add them on. And it just makes it easy as an end user uh, to manage those pieces. If I wanted to get details on one of the projects, I would just double click it. And by selecting that project, I'm going to get into later, Damon talked about, we're going to talk about how, how you set up a project. But while I'm here, I want to touch on this box on the right. And it's called the status box. And the reason is, when you think about most systems, when you're trying to get information, you've got to run reports. So sometimes you just want to know on the fly, you know, what is the status in this project? So I can quickly, I could run the job status report, but I don't even need to run a report. There's an online view of some of the information. So quickly seeing contract and funded value. How many hours have been charged to this project? What have we built? If I want to know the detail of what's behind it, Anytime you see this line with a number underneath it, it means I can drill into it. So I'm going to drill into that AR balance. And you can see here are the open customer ledger entries for this particular project. If I wanted to know more about one of them, so you can see that this one right here, the client owed us $1,600. Now it's down to $672. I could actually pull up the original sales order. I could also drill into this remaining amount of 672 to see you know, the application of payments or credits against it. So you can see in this example, there's a $1,000 payment that got applied. And to actually see the details of that, I can hit Navigate, and it allows me to move across the entire system. So now I can see information about what bank account did that come out of, or go into, I should say, um, or other details regarding the customer or the GL impact. So just hitting that show related documents, I could see it went into our B of A account on January 25th of this year. So really, it makes it easy for a user to not only get a status, but drill in to see details. And to give people an idea of the breadth of the application, because in a one hour preview, we can't go through the whole uh, system, but you can see from this department list the kind of capabilities that are all built into the system and all fully integrated. So everything from financial management, you know, so your GL, cash management, AP, AR, and fixed assets, sales order processing, purchase order management, warehousing and manufacturing. We're going to spend a lot of time within projects. So that's for the companies that are doing professional services work, how they manage that workflow. Product contracts is for companies that resell products to the federal government resource planning, service management, HR and payroll, but we also integrate with uh, key payroll partners. Um, and pretty much you can integrate with any payroll product. Uh, and then there's administration from an overall perspective. So that's the, the first piece that we're going to talk about is the base system. The second thing we're going to get into is reports. So you're going to see that in the system there's reports for every module. So within, whether I'm in the project side or the sales side, you know, you're going to see reports within sales, within financial management, the general ledger you're going to see reporting. In addition to the reports that are canned reports inside the system, there's also a query tool. And one of the things that we've done is we built out a standard data cube. And then we connected it to Excel, but you can connect it to other front ends. And we built out some sample views for clients 
so they can get a snapshot of the business more in picture format. So in this example, this is a financial dashboard. So it's showing me a trend of revenue, profit, and AR. Uh, a balance sheet dashboard, so showing me the key details of you know, cash balance, what does our AR look like, key ratios for the business, uh, an income statement. And you can see there's little filters up top, so you can filter for any period. So it's showing me information about the current period, year to date, quarterly trend of data, and then also next to the expense or revenue category, you're seeing the trend across four quarters of that type of expense cash flow, and then different indirect rate views. So these are some of the standard views uh, that are built out inside the system, and they're available for all users of the application. In addition to the standard views, that data cube allows you to build your own view on the fly. So let me go over to the project views, and we'll talk a little bit about the kind of measures uh, that are available for somebody analyzing on the fly. So this is a set of project dashboards, so everything from an income statement by project, income statement by project and task, a labor analysis report. So when I select a project in a range of tasks in a period of time, I'm seeing the breakout of how many hours are charged um, by individual. But if I want to look at it by labor category, I could do that. So you can decide, you know, how do you want to analyze this data? In addition, GL impact, so this is showing for a project a breakout of labor, ODCs, your indirects, um, you know, a, a broad picture of expense by project. Then the project spend report, you're kind of combining information from the, the income statement by project with some spend data. So what does that mean? So what you're looking at is, again, you choose the project period and task and it's showing revenue for those selections, all of your operating expenses, including allocation of indirects, net income or loss, and also what was spent. So if you look up on that formula bar that spent, what it means is how much of the funding did you use in that period? So you can see it was $183,000. So every night the system does a calculation of what's been spent. So that can include both stuff that you've posted and unposted. And what I mean by unposted is you might have had time you recorded on a TNM project and you've actually consumed that funding. You could actually see that in addition to the ones that you've already invoiced. So what I'm seeing here is what I've invoiced, but you could include the ones that haven't been invoiced yet. Over to the right, you're seeing the burn rate. So how much of that funding are you using every month? Then based on the average of the last three months, the system will divide that by what's left and now you can see I've got, if I continue at the same pace, a little over nine and a half months of funding left. So if any of your contracts have you know, the limitation of funds clause where you need to notify the government 60 days prior to when you hit 75% of funding consumed, great way for alerting uh, to happen. So you know, kind of a, a big picture of you know, some of the capabilities inside the system. And now what we're going to do is kind of go through uh, those key aspects that Damon talked about. So project setup, collecting time and expenses, and billing as part of the normal workflow uh, inside the system. So before we, go, before we go through that, um, let's go ahead and let's launch one of the polls, Damon, to get a little feedback of you know, who are the type of folks that are on the line today. All right, so we'll um, uh, do a poll here on what kind of accounting system um, you're currently using. We have oh, yeah, operating. Whoops, sorry. I just seem to have lost my. There we go. Wouldn't be a good presentation. <laughs> though, but it's a couple of technical difficulties. Absolutely. Sorry about that, folks. So, um, yeah, what accounting system does your company currently operate on? And, and we have a lot of folks who use different uh, different stuff. Uh, QuickBooks, uh, Dell Tech, Microsoft Dynamics, uh, Procast, or, or something else. Um, it looks like we have a lot of folks on the line, uh, Paul, who are on QuickBooks, which is not surprising. I know we have a lot of folks who migrate up from QuickBooks into the Dynamics um, market. So. All right. Yeah, so it looks like right now there's, uh, I guess, about 30% that's on QuickBooks, about a little over 20 that are on Dell Tech products, 
you know, another uh, 15 on other products, and uh, you know, there's also a cut of them on here already on Microsoft Dynamics. And Microsoft has several different products, um, and NAV, you know, like we mentioned, for mid-market companies is the leading product. So, all right, that's great to know. So we got a little cross-section of folks uh, that are on the phone today. And uh, what I want to do now is uh, let's hop into a project and talk a little bit about uh, some of the project setup capabilities uh, inside the application. So let me go to, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about lists. So I'm in a list of projects here. And we're going to actually hop into one of the particular projects. But before we do that, one of the things you can do is you can actually take data and show it as a chart inside a nav. So if you decided, you know, what is something you want to analyze, maybe contract value uh, and funded value, and then decide how do you want to group it. So in this case, I'm showing it by type of client. Um, so you can see how much work we have that's commercial, federal, state, and local government. Um, and what you're able to do is you can actually build these little charts, and you can save them. So last presentation, I built one someone talked about. They wanted to see the contract value um, by client type. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that one up. And this is an example of what you can do. So now I can look at a high level to see that most of my, my commercial work is all FFP and T&M, but you can see federal, you know, I've got uh, cost plus six fee, award fee, and also T&M, and then my state government work is all T&M work. So, you know, you can create these views and save them and reuse them in addition. So just kind of one thing I forgot that I wanted to pop back to. Now let's go back to our list and let's open up a project and talk a little bit about the project setup and some of the capabilities here. So early we touched on the status box, which I think is a pretty neat uh, component. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the setup of a new project. So you can see from the general tab I've got information like your internal uh, project number, description of the work. Who is the client you're doing the work for? Uh, and then when I look into this field, uh, what it does is it, it pulls from that customer table. So I can set up the, my DOD customer one time, assign it to multiple projects, and it makes sure that I have consistency of data. So if I want to run a report to see how much work is done with a certain agency or sub-agency, easy to do. If you remember from a few minutes ago, we looked at information on contracts by client type. So this is where that type of data is stored. So it's available both inside the system and then from Excel or that data cube that we showed. Uh, who is the PM? So in this case, I've just chosen from a list of our customers the type of contract, the period of performance. So these are just fill, fields you're filling out that are going to be used for whether you the invoicing side, incurred cost submission, reporting, et cetera. When I go to the posting tab, this is showing information regarding billing and revenue and overall, we'll call it accounting and project accounting setup of this particular project. So this is telling me that this is a cost plus six fee project. Both the billing and revenue side were leveraging similar concepts. Uh, the billing pool group is related to your indirects your fee percent, any type of withholding on this job. So these are all, there's some standard setups, but there's the ability for end users to actually configure it. So we see more and more clients are getting into complex contracts that are hybrid types, um, or uh, when you think about application of indirects, it's unique to the contract. So the flexibility of the setup helps you to meet those unique contract types. Speaking of the contract itself, if the work being done is task order driven from some type of IDIQ contract or any type of government-wide acquisition vehicle, you can assign the contract number to the work being performed so you can analyze how much work is being done under a specific vehicle because people invest money to maintain and win new vehicles. They want to know how much business is being driven through there. Contracting office related to the work, also the paying office related to the work. So this is, when you think about it, the main setup of the project. But beneath the main project, you've got what we call a work breakdown structure. 
So this is how you're defining both that work package and the details related to the funding side of it. And also if you had whether it's a you fund you're funded by Clint or Akron, uh, you can see the details of that here. Uh, and then when I look at any one of these individual subtasks, I can see the overall contract and funded value. You can see this two million and almost two million of funding and contract value that's made up of one or multiple modifications. So anytime again you see that number with a line underneath of it, it means you can drill into it, right? So uh, we'll have to ask some questions at the end of people to see if they're listening or not. There you go. So when I drill into that, you can see all the history here. So if I wanted to make a mod to that contract, I could just go in and we'll just say that uh, we received a mod today. I just hit F8, it copies the line above it, and we'll hit T for today's date. So if we mod this thing and say it was a half a million dollar mod and it's fully funded, if there was a separate funded fee, I could identify that. And then once I say OK at the overall mod level, and now when I say OK at this level, you're going to see the main project that got updated. So it automatically rolls all the tasks to the main project, 2.7, 2.5 million there. And when I go back to that WBS, you're going to see that that subtask here also got updated, 2.6 and 2.4 million. So whether it's a mod to the contract value, funded value, a mod to the POP, you can build that mod history right inside the system. The system also has the ability to manage documents. So if I had an email from my COTAR on that, or I had uh, you know, maybe a, a Word document or a PDF document, you can actually take those documents uh, from the desktop and actually drag and drop them. So I could actually take a document and associate it with the record. It drops it into SharePoint for me and makes it available for others. So if you use SharePoint and it can be the free version, it's a great way to manage you know, documents related to the system. And we see that happen all the time is you've got information that's not something that is structured that you would plug into a system, but you want to relate it to it. Makes it really easy to do that and tie those things together. Other thing about the, the task order level is there's actually a task order card. And what the task order card allows you to do is override things. So we see all the time people have you know projects that the labor is fixed price, but maybe ODCs are cost type. You know, so at the task level or subtask level, you can identify those contract types, model it like it's been issued not have to do calculations offline, um, and be able to invoice everything out of the system. So it gives you the flexibility to meet you know, the needs uh, that companies have when they sell to the federal government. So that's a little bit about that uh, WBS structure. And a couple other things to note is people also like the fact that you can define whether these levels are visible on certain types of documents. So you might have a labor only task or CLIN. I can just make it visible on a timesheet and not have it visible on expense report because you know I don't want people to make mistakes. How do you help that from happening? Limit their choices to what the ones are that are correct. Uh, you can also define who can charge to projects and also what period they can charge to. And then what's the approval hierarchy? that are starting to leverage this hierarchy to build a third level where they'll have not only um, internal folks approve it, but they might have the doing this for any level of WBS, 
you can compare the spent or build value to the funded or budgeted value. So we talked about funding. We're going to talk about budgeting in just a minute. And then you just identify what percent do you want to alert that person at. You know, so 60, 75, and 90. And then you're just selecting who should be alerted. If I alert the PM, it pulls it from, if you remember earlier on that main setup, we had the project manager at the task level. You can assign a task manager. And then as I go over to the right, you can have just email addresses you key in. So maybe there's a project accountant or you want to notify the operations director. You can decide who gets notified. So we're going to budgeting next. But before I do, billing is just easy. It's a term people understand when you generate an invoice or bill. Spent, what that means is each night the system calculates what the total spend was. So it's not just stuff that's been billed. It's stuff that's been recorded on a timesheet. So if you think about as a services company, labor is your biggest component. What it's doing is it's going out to the timesheets to figure out for T&M and cost type projects, you know, how much of the funding did they use because they recorded eight hours yesterday? So it's actually doing that calculation for you every night versus you have to wait until the end of your timesheet period. And if you're doing semi-monthly timesheets, you know, it, it, there's a big lag. So this helps to reduce that burden on people. All right, so we're going to get back to a little bit about budgeting because I think that more and more people are looking for ways to provide operations with tools to better manage projects. So this is the place where I can define what is the budgeted hours that are projected um, for a resource in this project. I can also budget out any other type of direct cost. So I've got my budgeted labor. In this case, I've just got lodging on here, but I could have other budgeted ODCs. Once I set up one month budget, there's a copy function. And what copy allows me to do is actually copy, whether it be the labor budget or the ODC budget, out over multiple months. So if you build a one month labor budget, I could say, copy that labor budget. I could put some type of percent increase on labor, either on a person's anniversary date or on a particular date, and then copy it out over multiple months. So I might copy that one month out to the next 11. Now I've got an annual labor budget. And the system also has the ability, you know, since there's a work calendar for resources, it knows how many hours someone should be working per period. And once you assign them for, in this case, by the month, I assigned 80 hours to Andrew in March. If, if that's a 160-hour month, it knows there's a 0.5 FTE and it's going to copy out 0.5 over those outgoing months. So it really makes uh, the budgeting process easier for people. Um, in addition, there are import export capabilities uh, to and from Excel there. So that's a little bit about, we talked, in this case it was a cost type project, you know, so we didn't need to define billing uh, beyond we've got costs that flow through and then how do indirects get applied and how is the fee applied and any withholding. Let me go to a T&M and let's talk a little bit about how T&Ms are different and some of the capabilities regarding managing your T&M contracts. So let's go back to our home page so I can remember you know, what's the usual project I use. That's one of the other great things about that My Job section. It's a, it's a great way for people to remember things. Uh, so now when I go into uh, this T&M project, you're going to see a very similar setup on the general tab and contracting tab. The pricing is defined on a project basis. So when I go to my list of resource prices, you can see all of the, the planned bill amounts inside the system. If I wanted to send this data off to Excel, and you can see it's also uh, date sensitive, so if I wanted to send this data off to Excel, I could just hit Control-E, or there's just a function on any one of these lists to actually send that data off to Excel. So when I send it off to Excel, you're going to see that that information, it just was um, pulled over to Excel. And let's go ahead and let's set up um, a future bill amount. So in this example, I'm going to take that trainer three labor category, and I could do it inside the system. Um, but I could also do it right in Excel. So 
I'm going to say that trainer three bills at, uh, we'll say 150. And I'm going to take that, those first two years, and let's make a multi-year schedule. So I'm going to take uh, 2014 through 2018, and I just did some quick entry in Excel, and let's take that information and let's paste it back into uh, Dynamics NAV. So it's a way that um, I could actually do that stuff offline, use that copy and paste, to bring it back in. So it makes it really easy as a user. I still need to have security rights to be able to access this table. I can't get into it if I don't have security. And it still does all the validation. So it's going to make sure this is a valid date, this is a valid labor category, this is a valid project. So it makes it easy to move things back and forth between Excel. And you can do that in any list or ledger. So now once I've defined, you know, here are the you know, the bill rates for those different labor categories. Now I want to show who are the people that are working on this under particular labor category. So when I go to my resource labor category default list, we talked earlier about assigning people to the project, but sometimes one individual might work, depending on the project, several different labor categories. So now you can see that list of people that are I'm on here to charge and what labor category codes are under. And if I wanted to add somebody new, I could just go in, add another resource, uh, and then the system will pull in their default labor category code, and then I could just choose what they are on this project. So in this case, we're going to say that uh, Paul Lester is a trainer three. So now it knows that Paul is a trainer three, and in fact, let's look at all people on here that have that labor category code. So we'll filter to that value. So we've got two people that are trainer three, and you can see that right now that's going to bill out at $155 an hour. So it gives you the ability to set up these things in advance. You do it one time, and now the system is going to automate that all the way through the process. So a lot of great tools to manage projects, manage your resources, uh, and really reduce errors by putting the right controls in place. Once you set up that main project and define all the billing, budgeting, uh, costing elements of it, you know, now we can go and record time. So now we're going to uh, the timesheet side. So this is uh, strictly browser-based. So no matter where your folks are in the world, whether they're on a government site, as long as they can get out to the internet, they can get to the timesheets, expense reports, purchase requisitions, and approval of documents. So what's going to happen is a couple of different things. One is they can see their PTO balance. So whatever their current balance is in terms of PTO, they can just select that option. In this case, I can see I've got 32 hours of vacation available to me. If I needed to ask for PTO off, I can go ahead and go through the request process, and it's going to request that time off and trigger an email off to my approver of time. I can define favorites. So this would be a list of projects that I charge to on a regular basis. I can manage them inside my favorite list. And then whenever I create a new timesheet, the system automatically copies them down for me. From here, you know, once I've set up my timesheets for the day and system supports you know, flexible timesheet periods, I just go to the day that I worked. So uh, yesterday, maybe I put four hours onto this project if I needed to enter a comment. I can enter the comment there. Uh, and then maybe I put four hours on uh, this project Kempster. I can enter my time, save it. That's the process I'm going to go through on a daily basis. If I needed to make a change to a previously saved cell, the system is going to automatically track the comment. So uh, let's change that from six to four hours. And now what's going to happen is you know, once I make that selection, system is going to require that I put a reason for that change. And what it's going to do is it's going to track all that information. So if the government comes in to do a timesheet audit, you can give them someone's timesheet with any changes they made um, to that timesheet. Once I finish my timesheet for the period, I'm just going to go ahead and submit it. And then this is going to kick off the workflow for the approval to happen. So um, intuitive, 
really easy and fast to make those uh, entries in terms of timesheets. Other thing to mention is people only see the charge codes that are available to them. So if I wanted to add another line to my timesheet, I could add additional lines. You're only going to see the list of projects that you're assigned to. So whether they're direct projects or indirect projects, you just see that list. As I start to type, it filters it down. So just another way that we prevent errors by giving people just what they should see. All right, so now that's a little bit about timesheets. I won't go into the approval process today, but this is a good point to, to mention that if you have questions, go ahead and submit them. We're, we might not be able to get to all the questions on the phone today, um, but we're happy to follow up with you afterwards. And then if you want a detailed presentation, we're happy to either you know, have a one-on-one -on -one presentation with you, whether it's over the web or in person. All right, so we talked a little bit about timesheets. Let me spend a little time on expense reports um, before we go ahead and process um, the invoicing side. So expense reports, similar concepts where you only see the, the codes that are available to you. So I'm going to go ahead and let's, let's create a new expense report. So we're going to go ahead and start the expense reporting process. What's the period that I traveled? You know, so maybe this was for uh, my March travel, so we'll say it was uh, March 2nd through the 5th. Give a description of the travel. So um, we'll say that we traveled to uh, go to North Carolina. And if I received an advance, I could enter that in, and we're going to go ahead and save that. So now it's just created my travel expense report to North Carolina. And then from here, uh, I could actually input my expense lines, but if I travel based on per diem, a lot of our clients are traveling based on per diem, they can go ahead and use the per diem wizard to enter that. So we're going to go ahead and choose where we traveled to. So North Carolina was the location. Uh, what was the destination within North Carolina? So as I start typing, uh, let's go ahead and we'll say we went to Raleigh, and then what's the county, Wake County, click Next. The period that I traveled, so in this case I'm going to just, we'll say that we were there for the whole period of time. Was it project related? So I'm going to choose the project and WBS codes that it went against, so that was for go live during this project. The lodging that it was associated, so this is the the account that it's going to hit back inside the accounting system, and then the meals, what's the meals code we're going to use. So we're going to go ahead and use our per diem code there. Click Next, and you see for meals and incidentals, what's the list um, of meals and incidentals? And if for some reason maybe breakfast was included in lodging, I could uncheck that, and it'll calculate the actual meals and incidentals minus breakfast. You can see your lodging ceiling here in case, in this case it was $90 for Raleigh on the date that I traveled in March. Uh, what was the room tax? Uh, and now if there was any unallowable amount, the system would automatically put it into an unallowable category or an unallowable segment for unallowable, and you can decide what unallowable category to go against. If you get it approved by the government, you could put it into allowable category. Click Finish, and what it's going to do is it's going to calculate based on my travel, um, what were the total amounts that I'm going to recover. So you can see that it handles the first day and last day 75% for meals and incidentals, and then for the other days, the full amount in this case for two days. If I needed to put any attachments against this, I could just go open up my attachment list and drag and drop attachments against it. Uh, and then once I finish that, I'm just going to go ahead and save it and then submit it. And then this would kick off that workflow uh, for the next person in the process to improve it. So really, uh, you know, streamlined process, entering it from anywhere, and easy uh, for end users to do that. So I've done some of those entries on the web, so both expense reports and timesheets. And uh, we're going to go back into the accounting system. But before we do, uh, we talked a little bit about some of the ways that this integrates We've talked about SharePoint. We've talked about Excel and email. It'd be great to know uh, for the folks on the phone, what Microsoft tools are you already using today? Sure. So I've got a little follow-up there, Paul, to uh, 
just a quick question. If you just uh, select the ones that apply to you, what Microsoft products uh, does your company currently uh, incorporate? Obviously, Excel, uh, very common, SharePoint, um, Outlook, and as we talked about, Office 365 as well. So, yeah, we're, we're about 100% on Excel, which I expect that uh, a lot of folks do like that. So it's a, it's a great tool to use. And we got a lot of SharePoint users, too, so about 50% uh, are using SharePoint today. Uh, looks like 90% using Outlook. And Office 365 is smaller than I expected. It's about uh, 18, 19 percent right now. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of adoption there, and, and we see a lot of folks, uh, you know, looking to leverage Office 365. So, all right, great, thanks, Damon. All right, so we've entered some of that information off on the web, you know, and now uh, let's go ahead and let's pull up first that, you know, that expense report that we started to build off on the web, um, let's go ahead and pull it up inside the accounting system, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, managing your indirects and also the labor distribution side. So let's go ahead and we'll pull up our list of expense reports, and you're going to be able to see that uh, here was the one that I just entered, traveling to North Carolina. You can see it's submitted. And once I open this up, you're going to see all those details that we entered on the web they're all available inside of NAV now. So nothing I need to rekey. But as a, an accountant, if something is done wrong, I could reject this. I could also update it. You can see who still needs to approve it. So oftentimes employees will submit the expense report, but the approver, you know, it gets stuck in a queue or they're not available. Um, but so now accounting can see, you know what, I need to contact uh, Joyce and Josh because they need to approve this so I can process it. So you're getting more real-time visibility of information uh, throughout the system. So once you recorded those expenses on the web, it's available um, inside the system. It hasn't hit any financial account until accounting does the final review, turns it into a purchase invoice and posts it, but the information is available um, to you immediately. So now we talked a little bit about entering time. That time, uh, every night we're bringing it in from a reporting perspective, but in terms of the final labor distribution, uh, that's done as part of um, typically your timesheet period process. So whether you're weekly, biweekly, semi-monthly, um, it's done during that period. So the first thing clients are going to do is they're going to run their missing time report. It's going to give them visibility of you know, who hasn't entered time, what time hasn't been approved, et cetera. One of the great things with the reports now is that you've always been able to print them, and you can also print them anytime. So I know uh, some systems, you can't reprint things. This allows you to reprint it as of any period in time. But now you can also print it as a PDF. So you can actually print it on your home page as a PDF and email it, that PDF, as soon as it opens up. Uh, print it to Word, Excel or also schedule it. So if you want to schedule a report, you can set it up to be scheduled and then the next day it can show up in your report inbox. So maybe you don't want to, you want to view it as of 6 o'clock, but I've got to go home at 5.30 because I've got to pick up the kids. You can schedule it for 6 and it's going to show up tomorrow in your inbox on, on the NAV homepage. So once you look at missing time, the next thing you're going to do is there's nothing magic to this, although I've heard people ask, you know, can you shock the employee when they log into their uh, machine? But, you know, you've got to use the old-fashioned way. You've got to call them up and hound them or email them, get them to enter the time. Then you import that approved time. So once you import it, it's going to create, you know, a journal for each of the staff. You run the labor distribution. What that does, it calculates the per-hour amount. So whether you use standard rate or effective rate uh, in terms of labor distribution or dilution, uh, the system incorporates those methods. Um, and then once you've run that, you can run your time journal summary report. And this is going to give you a preview of what's going to happen when I post this. And the system posts things across all the ledgers in real time. So you don't close any of the ledgers, but it's showing you in detail. So you know, by employee how many hours they work for each project, 
what what is that labor distribution? What's the impact on the project in terms of hours and labor costs? What's the GL impact? And again, same idea in terms of saving these things off. Once I complete that, we've got exports, ADP, paychecks, and payroll networks, our strategic partners, but we've worked with, I'd say, probably 25 different payroll providers. So we can create that export file so you don't have to rekey the data. Then once you finish, you go ahead and post it. When you post it, it hits the general ledger, project ledger, resource ledger, all in real time. So now before now we've captured time, we've captured expenses, and before we go to the billing side, I want to talk about managing your indirects because you know, this is something that for clients that have a lot of cost type work, it's a big part of what accounting does. If you don't have a system that automates this, it becomes you know, a major uh, efficiency improvement for your organization. So the first step is you're defining what is your rate structure. So in my example, I've got fringe, overhead, company site, client site, G&A pool. The system doesn't have any limitations in terms of the number of pools, you know, whether they're final pools or uh, intermediate pools slash service centers. It, it's all up to you know, your imagination in terms of how you define it. You want to have something logical and consistent so the government's going to approve it. But once you define your structure, uh, the next step is you define the calculation of that pool. So for my overhead company site pool, how I calculated that is I define which accounts are incorporated in my overhead account, and then my base here is my direct labor after fringe has been applied. And this is just made up of a range of GL accounts. So if I go to my overhead account, what you're going to see when I look at the details of that is it's just a range of my GL accounts. So 7,000 through 7,700, that is the range of my overhead account. The next step is once I define what my account structure is, um, both pool and base, then I'm telling the system when I allocate costs, what happens to it. So it could go to projects or it could be an intermediate pool which goes into account to be later picked up. In this case, this is a final pool, so I'm taking that loaded overhead rate, and I'm allocating it out to projects at both an actual rate and a provisional rate. So it's going both to the project ledger and general ledger at both. And then finally, what is the provisional rate that I'm using for allocation and billing? So you can see the history of it, so it's date sensitive. My provisional rate, uh, the system is also showing once you get the government to do your year-end audit, and you get your final rate, you can also plug that in. So the system is going to help you to manage both of those. And when you're over in the general ledger, you're going to actually see the detail of those allocations in the allocation account. So I'm just highlighting a couple of them right here. We're just talking about our company site overhead pool. And you can actually whoops, highlighted the wrong two. Um, you can actually drill into this to see the detail of how those not only the costs were accumulated, but the allocation itself. So in this case, the base times the rate, uh, and you can see how much was allocated to individual projects and tasks. So really flexible, powerful tool to manage your allocations all within the system. So now we've recorded costs, and now the, the last step is the billing side of it. So to generate invoices, you run this function to create the invoice. You're defining the project that you're running for, a range of projects. You can also, again, same idea. If you wanted to schedule those, you can. And then which different tasks within that main project are you billing? So you could bill all of them or just some. Uh, so you can decide what's going to be on that invoice. And you can also set up um, basically the structure of what I, how you want the invoice to look and save it. So once I decide on all those options, I say OK, and what it does is it creates an invoice worksheet. So that's in the invoice proposal section. And what you're going to see in this section is you're going to see the list of all the invoices that have been created, but they haven't been processed yet. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to print one off and talk a little bit about how you can view this information. So the first section is it's saying group by, 
And this is, how do you want the invoice to look? So the different sections of it. So category group, that relates to your different uh, direct cost categories. So your labor section, you know, travel, materials, subcontractors. Uh, I guess I shouldn't say subcontractors, subcontractors, because subcontractors could be also in your labor section. So you could also group it by category group plus type of labor. So that would show the, the labor as a separate um, from your direct labor. Uh, do you want to show the labor by resource, which shows the person's name or by labor category code? You know, print the clan. I, I won't go through all the different options. I will preview it uh, so you can get a sense for uh, what the invoice will look like. Obviously, it won't show our logo. It's going to show your logo. Um, but you can see information about that contract, so billing period, period of performance, uh, information regarding uh, the contract itself, so what type of contract, funded amount, how much fee uh, was funded, total funding left. And now I'm showing um, broken out by my labor components so I can see my direct labor, my subcontract labor, uh, total amount for labor, uh, application of indirect, total fee, and then it's going to uh, the next task. So really, uh, it's going to help companies that if you produce your invoices offline, you can automate them all within the system. Same idea here. Export them out, Excel, PDF, and Word. Or you could have just printed it to PDF and sent it. These can also get approved. So if accounting does the initial review and you send them off for approval, you can do that. It's going to actually send an email off to the PM um, or whoever you designate within operations as the PM, and they get the request to approve it. After they review it, um, it'll go from pending approval to release. You can go ahead and post it, and now it becomes a posted document, uh, and then you're going to see it in this posted invoice section. And then you can always reprint these, not only with the formats we showed earlier, but you can also print them off on government format. So uh, really, I think that the key message is you know, a fully integrated system. We covered a lot of content today. Um, but for a, a professional services company, it's going to provide all the reporting, all the workflow and compliance uh, that contractors need to run their business. So we've got a couple minutes left. And uh, let's go ahead and just let's take a few questions. Um, before we close things out, because uh, we do want to close out on time. So uh, let me go to the list here, Damon, and I guess the, you go ahead. Okay. So first question I see on here is related to um, system question, which is uh, we're currently on uh, Dell Tech GCS Premier. Uh, have you migrated companies off of Dell Tech? And what is the period of time that it takes? So it's actually two questions, but that's okay. We'll cover them both. So, yeah, we've migrated uh, probably about 60 or 70 companies off of Dell Tech. Uh, so we've got a lot of experience with that. In terms of the time frame, it's a little bit more difficult to answer because it depends on the client. But projects are typically between 90 to 120 days. But for more complex companies, uh, that can take a little bit longer. Uh, next question is regarding pricing and uh, in regards to price, I don't like to typically cover it in this because it's hard to, um, there's a couple different pricing models. So on the pricing question, uh, we'll respond directly to you. We can provide the pricing. Um, but there is both uh, software as a service pricing or purchase pricing. So there could be some variation there uh, within that. Uh, there's a question here uh, in terms of compliance. So by running this system, does it guarantee compliance? And uh, how I'll answer that is no system uh, guarantees compliance. The government doesn't, and DCA in particular, doesn't approve a system. It approves a client's use of a system. So whether it's Microsoft Dynamics or Dell Tech doesn't guarantee you compliance. But I can tell you that our clients have 100% success rate uh, going through audits. Uh, so I can see that we've actually uh, gone through all the time today. And there's several more questions that we couldn't get to, um, but we promise that uh, we'll follow up through email or phone call to answer yeah, those absolutely. questions. Yep. 
But uh, thanks again for your time, and have a great afternoon. And like Damon mentioned, we'll have this posted to YouTube, I guess. Uh, later today. Later today. <laughs> great. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care.